Hi everyone, welcome to Tech Talks. Today we're here to talk about INTJs and life advice. And so Chris, would you like to tell us a bit about you? Sure, uh, I'm Chris, I run the YouTube channel Lacera Psych. I've been studying MBTI for quite a long time now, probably like eight, nine years at this point. Um, I'm a certified MBTI practitioner, a psychology post bachelorate uh, researcher as well. Zero Psych has the best INTJ YouTube channel, and he's like rolls his eyes. <laughs> um, that you should check out. It's called the Zero Psych. I'll have it linked below. And Angelina. Um, hi, I'm Angelina. I'm from England. I'm a psychologist. Been using Type for many, many years, and um, really interested in type development stuff. And uh, what else about me? Um, yeah, I just work with, tend to work with businesses and um, in, as a coach and development person and uh, mother of two small children. So that's me. Yeah. And Angelina is the author of the book, The Shadows of Type. And so you might recognize her from there. And Karen? I'm Karen Kiefer and I'm, um, I've been a type practitioner for 35 years. I'm retired now. Um, I, one time I was part of the APT training faculty to qualify people to use the MBTI. And, um, and I've, I've used type in a variety of settings and with all sorts of people. And, um, and now I'm retired. So the APT is the Association of Psychological Type. I'll have the information linked below too for anyone who's curious and wants to get more involved there. And Michael. Yes, hi. I'm Michael, um, a humble layman surrounded by pros here, <laughs> panel veteran. But it's been a while. It's been a while. So it's good to see everybody and uh, good to meet you, Karen. So good intro, Michael. I'm not going to compliment you because I make you feel awkward that way. <laughs> And so, hi, my name is Joyce. I'm a certified MBTI master practitioner, and I facilitate the instrument in organizations. I also coach people, and I help people with the discovery process of figuring out their best fit type. And so, INTJs, my first question to you is, what life advice would you give your younger self or to other younger INTJs? I actually had to prepare for this because when I first saw the questions, I thought, this is really hard. I would, wouldn't know. Um, but I, th I think one of my biggest insights, and this is really type related, is that not everybody makes connections as quickly as INTJs do. So I would often find myself trying to, you know, explain something and say, yeah, you know, you know what it is, um, and then walk off leaving the person confused. So I think one of the things, um, and it leaves you a bit misunderstood and people think you're weird. Um, so I think it would be about recognizing that that's a, a talent you have that might not be everybody's. So explain yourself quicker would be one of the ones. And um, the other one was about, I, I would get quite focused and expert in certain things and narrow down my options. So I would tell my young INTJ to keep your options open a bit longer and, and, and not be so stubborn when other people are giving you ideas. Absolutely. And so you mentioned, Angelina, that iron teachers have this advanced pattern recognition. And what can happen is they can say a statement that sums up the essence of something really well, but people might wonder, how did you get there? Can you explain your process or give me more information? And then the INTJ is like, oh, yeah, I have to explain myself more. <laughs> well, the young INTJ is like, why aren't you getting it? Didn't I say that? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's not, not realizing how much you don't explain thing, how, how yeah, broad that explanation is. So true. So one thing that I would tell my younger self is ask more questions and be sure you really understand the situation or how this works or what's going on before you jump into action. I um there were many things that I did without understanding really fully what the impact was going to be. Um, and another thing I would tell my younger self is get more exercise. It's wonderful to spend hours and hours curled up with a book, but um, <laughs> which is how I spent my younger decades. But really, when you get older, it, it's nice if your body works better. I think I'd tell my younger self not to be so serious. And uh, I think growing up, I was always the most serious person in any room. 
to the point where I'd constantly have like teachers and people coming up to me like, hey, you know, why don't you smile more? Why don't you interact with the class? That sort of thing. And and I think, you know, somewhere in my early 20s, I kind of hit that point where I was like, you know what? It doesn't really matter. Like, who cares if I'm having a little bit of fun or enjoying myself or not taking things too serious every now and then? It's almost like you're <laughs> like the inner ESFP awakening where it's just like, all right, like not everything has to be 20 year end game plan. Getting into that goofy side. Yeah, and it's not like you have to live there, but it's like like five percent of that in your life will allow you to kind of unwind every now and then. I, I, I second that. Don't be don't be grave. Have a sense of humor. Um, I think Karen's point about exercise is uh, uh, diet, exercise, sleep. These are things that I didn't I didn't take seriously myself until until I was in my thirties. And uh, frankly, I feel better now than I did in my in my twenties by far on account of these things. So it's something that. Um, uh, it, it's never too late to, to 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 start those routines, you know. And I'm I'm grateful um, <laughs> that that I have. I think in in preparing for this, it was hard to uh, to come up with advice for our type specifically because in thinking about it, I just kept falling back on stereotypes that I think through our panels we've proven are they they don't hold in many cases. Um, I also made the mistake of going on YouTube and just typing in life advice and seeing what showed up. And uh, it's a lot of uh, just so don't do that as my advice if you're looking for if you're looking for advice. It's a lot of cello music and um, crescendos, and you just you just imagine people watching these, and maybe it, maybe it works for some, but you imagine watching these and just saying, you know, I'm going to make some changes in my life, you know, and that holds for about five minutes, right? I think generally um, positive change is uh, part of a long process of working to take the right action over and over and over again. So it's just prudence, essentially. It's, it's pointing in the right direction, knowing the right course of action, and doing your best to take it over and over again. And that applies to everybody, I think. And um, aside from that, just for g generic advice, it's uh, um, don't concern yourself with things you have no control over. Uh, make things, save money. Don't broadcast your opinions to everyone except your close friends. And uh, don't argue about something you don't understand, which is most things for most of us. I see a lot of, um, I see a lot of bad arguments happening um, in the world lately, <laughs> you know? So that's my, that's my generic, that's my most generic advice. My, I guess to piggyback off that, I would also tell my younger self not to argue with people who have no desire to understand. Because I, you know, a younger my me would love to get on Reddit and get into like a ten-hour argument with someone who has no interest in changing their opinion. And sometimes, you know, I'm in that position as well, where it's like I'm not really because I, you know, I think I've got it figured out. Who knows if I do? But you know, really understand yourself. And are, nine times out of ten, arguing with someone, especially on the internet, is not going to lead to anything. And NTs love to argue. <laughs> yeah, avoid the Reddit argument. Is the <laughs> Yeah, with motivational videos, they're mostly productivity hacks. A lot of life advice videos have to do with the hustle culture that we have now. And so if that's not what you're aiming for, the advice might not be well suited towards you. But also there is good advice online too, but I noticed it, it tends to be suited in that direction a lot of the time. And so what Michael said about truly cultivating something that matters is like cultivating something that sticks and that you can actually incorporate in your life in a long-term manner. And uh, James Clear, he's an INTJ author, he mentions this. And it's that concept of improving 1% at a time it results in an exponential improvement over years. And so, yeah, that's some INTJ advice from an INTJ. Yeah, and I think that just jumping off of that, it's getting through something, if, if, if anybody's getting through, trying to work through something that's um, difficult. I spend a lot of time with people who have um, addiction problems. And there, there's, there's sometimes the, the, this, when you get that spontaneous sense of I need to make changes and you change things in a radical way and it just doesn't hold and you end up falling back to the position you were in at the beginning or somewhere even worse. And you do that over and over again and it gets so frustrating that you just give up. Um, it's really, I mean, there's, there's certain things that if, if there are bad habits, there are certain bad habits that are really 
um, destructive that you need to stop. But then there's a process of excavating everything that leads you toward that toward that habit. And that's just that is a long, a long process. But um, if there's something that what I've found is if there's something that you're going through, that's, that's really difficult, a very, if it's, if it's addiction or if it's a very destructive habit or, or just destructive ways of being, I think um, finding, finding a community of others who are also working through those same things is, uh, uh, is, is critical and, and actually, and taking their advice. That's, you know, that's the point of, I think that might be difficult. Maybe that is advice for, for our type specifically, um, although not exclusively is, um, do what you're told when you're in those situations, find someone who's, who's conquered a problem that you have and then do what they tell you to, to do. Yeah. And there's also advice given to people with addiction can apply for everyone as well. So there's the 12 step program that's initially only for addicts, but honestly, it could be used in anyone's life to change themselves. A lot of advice you can take from one scenario and you can generalize it to so many other scenarios too. So a lot of advice for INTJs, they're also good for human growth too. So no matter what type you are, if you struggle with this, you could also improve that area too. So, and the yeah. thing about the thing about something like 12 step is you, it's, I, I, I know a good number of people who I, who, who I think would really benefit from, from 12 stepping, but the, the thing is you need, you need a community of people who, who are, you know, who have been through that and will, will take you through it, you know, and that support network. So it's, it's that community aspect of things is especially as, uh, you know, eh, INTJ, Enneagram five, we like to isolate, we like to do our th things our own way, a lot of things we can work through on our own, and it's fine, but some things we can't. So yeah, just because you can work it through alone doesn't mean that's the most ideal option. I so agree with Karen as well about the exercise. When I was a kid, I would do anything to get out of exercise because I just wanted to sit and read my books. Um, and now I'm just like, you know, yoga addict, and I even run which I thought I would never, ever do. That was the biggest life shocker of my life when I started running. Didn't even know myself at that point. <laughs> it could be easy for INTJs or intuitives to fall into the cycle of mind over matter. So it's like, oh, I can just stay in my idea world the whole day or my that rich inner world of, like you said, exploring books or other things. And so you realize later, my body's actually a thing. You know, I thought it was just a conduit to express my thoughts and to observe reality, but I actually have to take care of this flesh suit, this flesh suit. I see. <laughs> All right. And so what's the best advice you've ever been given by someone else? Well, if I'm being honest, if I like the absolute best advice was from the woman who ran my MBTI certification program, because she was the one who told me to go get a degree in psychology. Um, and I think, the, the lesson that I kind of learned from that is like, like it's like take risks and talk to people who are in positions related to like the things you're interested in. Like, don't be afraid to like reach out and talk to someone who maybe is a professional in a field that you're interested in. Cause nine times out of 10, they're going to be willing to at least have a small conversation with you or kind of motivate you, especially if you show genuine interest. Um, yeah, and, and in general making connections is so important as INTJs where very prone to just doing things on our own and being like, uh, you know, oh, I can handle it. I, in fact, speaking of the life advice, this goes back to the first question. Something I wrote on Twitter just a couple months ago was if I could tell myself something two years ago, or sorry, four years ago, back when I was in college, it would be like, get to know your teachers. Because I went through all of my college course and like barely knew my teacher's names, straight A's, all that stuff. And at the end, I was like, well, now I know how many wanted to like write me letters of recommendation. It's like you're a straight A student, you got through all the stuff, student representative, and you don't know anybody. So and that's kind of not helpful. So, <laughs> so making those connections can be really powerful, even if it's something that you don't think you need. You show the importance of mentorship. So making connections with people who are at a greater stage of development or wisdom in a certain area that you may want to develop in. And it seems like networking is a huge thing too, even if it initially isn't that important to you. Well, I'm thinking about the best advice I've received, um, the first thing that came to mind was all the people whose advice didn't hit the mark because they didn't understand who I was. And it just, 
So the, I would say that the best advice that I've received um, was in areas where I don't have strengths. So having to do with relationships and having to do with dealing with the concrete world. And, um, and something that came to mind was um, I was working in a volunteer organization about 15 years ago. And the woman who was the head of the program um, suggested that I hide my gray. I was starting to get gray hair. And she said that my personality was brighter than I looked and that um, I should color my hair and uh, it would make a difference. And I took that advice and I've hidden my gray ever since and not regretted it. And my husband loves it. And that's something that I would never have thought to do. So that's maybe a maybe a trivial example, but it's like I say, my I think the best the, the advice that I receive that I took that made a difference tends to be in areas of, you know, dealing with concrete reality and dealing with how I come across to other people, which I tend not to be that aware of. That is good advice because it tackles the concept of how INTJs tend to not pay attention as much to the concrete world as you were saying. For instance, INTJs, some of them have death stares or they don't smile that much. And so sometimes them noticing, hey, oh, this is a way that I could come across as slightly more friendlier or this is a way that I could change something about my physicality to make people see me as more approachable. It's realizing that your physicality sends signals to other people. And it's like, wow, this really does make an impact. I probably should pay attention to this area, even though it doesn't really matter to me. I keep thinking of like the more difficult scenarios of like when someone, when, when you really need to shake somebody and to like wake them up to something that they might not be seeing. And I think a lot of times we, for good reason, might might dance around an issue. You don't want to hit somebody too hard with like a you know tough <laughs> tough advice. That's what I needed though personally. It when when you know certain points in my life when things were really difficult was I was just not listening to anybody, and I, I needed to, and eventually did find some people who had had a bit of wisdom, but were also really hard on me. And it was sort of there's um. Uh, Goodwill Hunting, the scene, if anybody's seen it, the scene with Robin Williams, where he he's, you know, he keeps going to to the Matt Damon character, Robin Williams, the psychiatrist, and he says, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And eventually Matt Damon breaks down and in, in tears. Uh, I, I needed the opposite, which was someone saying it is your fault and saying it to me over and over again and bonking me upside the head and not being not being easy with me. And I think I think we're um um, that, that's, that's more like the kind of advice that I do tend to give. It doesn't always go over well. It depends on, <laughs> it depends on what, what the person, what the person really needs. And if it's the time for that. So, so I haven't at some points been the best at giving advice, just saying for me personally to the question, it's the best advice I've ever gotten was just, just someone telling me that everything that was wrong in my life was was my responsibility fully i was fully responsible for it because i i would fall into uh resentment blaming other people and all those kind of defense and and offensive kind of mechanisms that i needed i needed a, a good hard punch in the face a few times um sometimes sometimes literally <laughs> to to um to get to get through something so for me personally that's what i'd say yeah, you are the common denominator in your life. So a lot of the things that happen in your life are a mirror to your own behavior and your own attitude or your own thoughts or your own habits that you may not be aware of. You know, that brings it back to Young's concept of projection, where it's a human tendency to project our shadow onto the outside world. So we're likely to blame other people or shove the responsibility to other people. But when we don't do that, we're able to also see the part we play in it too. For some people, that's helpful. I, I found this question quite hard because my initial reaction was, well, do I take advice from anybody? And certainly as a young INTJ, I, I didn't, when maybe I should have done. Um, had a similar um, experience there with a, a teacher actually saying to me, you should go and study psychology, and I did. I just went, yeah, all right then, which is probably the quickest I've ever taken advice. 
and haven't looked back. Um, and it's great. Whenever I see her, she says, do you still tell people I changed your life? I'm like, I do. I do indeed. So uh, that was one big one. Um, I tend to... I, I tend to only go to people for literally practical advice about stuff I don't understand or can't be bothered to look up. Like I need a new laptop. What what, what should I be looking for? Or can you recommend one? Um, which is a bit lazy. I do sometimes seek advice from my friend who's INFJ when I'm worried about making a relationship or communication error with someone uh, you know about sensitive issues I, I might send her a message and say is this right is, you know is this going to be taken okay um and it's usually no you have to do it this way um so i've taken that advice so knowing type has been really helpful for that and um the point about smiling ironically made me smile <laughs> because I, I I do have that deadpan face, but it, it usually means I'm really interested or I'm thinking um, that the amount of times in my life people would come up to me and go, smile, and I would just go, why? I've got nothing to smile about. Make me smile. And I, I, used to, I can't believe I used to speak to people like that. I still think it, but I don't say it out loud. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I, um, I, I think my it, even thinking about that question highlighted to me how – how stubborn I am to other people's advice sometimes, which I think isn't unlike a sort of, you know, shadow, the bad INTJ characteristic sometimes. Because you always think, you know, you know, you can see it clearly, you know what you're doing. Um, and clearly I, I don't, but it feels like I do. Yeah. Speaking about like taking advice from other people and what Michael said about like the harsh advice, the kind of punch in the face advice. I've always thought INTJs have, a, a unique relationship with ESTJs for that reason. Because I think we're one of the one types who can like really benefit from having an ESTJ in our life. Because it's like, we're not gonna like break down and <laughs> cry if they give us the TE, but they also have that like TESI force of being like, hey, this is the reality of why you're failing. Are you gonna do something about it? Or are you just gonna fail? And I feel like that, that for me is always why I've liked to kind of have an ESTJ or just an STJ somewhere in my life to give me that punch in the face every now and then. Yeah, you heard it here. INTJs like to get punched in the face. I'm kidding. <laughs> I was trying to be funny. I'm bad at jokes. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's good that INTJs can handle the blunt truth a little better than other types. Do you guys have anything else you'd like to add to this last uh, question? I'm going to give it a little bit of space and then I'm going to move on. Give advice time to breathe in your mind. Um, when other people give you advice, it can be very quick to dismiss it immediately. Or, or even take it on immediately, but instead give it like that, that one day period or even that like one hour period of just like, okay, what are the implications of this advice? And then once that has been allowed to process, then make a decision. Yes, young INTJs, the, 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 especially the, the stubborn among us, advice that we receive, you'll find in a decade, two decades, three decades time, a lot of it turns out to be true. A lot of that advice that you just shrugged off and disregarded does turn out to be the case. That's so true. And another thing I've noticed about INTJs, this is just a subsection of them, is that with introverted intuition, it can give you a lot of insight or discernment, like long-term discernment of actions are just about the larger implications of something. And so you might go throughout life seeing other people acting in very short-sighted ways or ways in which might be disappointing to you or might be like, why did you even do that? <laughs> like, why did you not think about the future? Why did you not think about the long-term implications of that thing? Just in the sense of people don't always act as intentionally as some INTJs. Like other people might seem like, a little irritating in that sense. And I probably am putting it in the wrong way, but I'm trying to capture the gist of some INTJ's experience that I, I notice. I would call it the knee-jerk reactions and, and nothing annoys me more than um, watching people in power. <laughs> Something happens and they, they do a complete knee-jerk reaction, short-term, an ill-thought-out thing to it. Uh, and yeah, it does make me sit and see the Joyce. You're completely right. <laughs> like, stop, think about. And I think I think it's, it is that thing about. That's another thing that can make you misunderstood is that looking into the future thing, which just happens naturally. Um, 
and, and sometimes that can be a bit misunderstood as well. And then you just expect everybody to, to, to do that. Like, look to the future. Have you not thought about where this is going and how it's all going to pan out? So, yeah, knee jerk reactions, quick fixes, sticking plasters. Ah. <laughs> mm -hmm. The next question I have for you all is what is the best piece of advice that you have given? So I coached a high school speech and debate team for a number of years. And um, the best advice that I gave was always at a teachable moment. So part of giving advice that sticks is recognizing that the person is ready to hear what you have to say. And I've gotten better at that as I've gotten older. Um, but I, the, the best advice that I gave those high school students was based on type. And um, my favorite story is a young man named Jose um, who went to a tournament and came back from his first round. And I said, how did it go? And he was doing an event called Dramatic Interpretation. And I'm telling some heart-rending story. And he said, it hadn't gone well at all. And I, I said, what happened? And he said, the audience was just dead. Like everybody was just looking at me like, and the judge too was very deadpan. And he said, and I just, I couldn't, you know, it, it I, my delivery was really flat. And I said, well, that's probably because you're an extrovert. And he said, what's an extrovert? And I said, let's go get a snack and I'll tell you all about it. And so I briefly described it to him. And then I told him that um, as an extrovert, he usually depends on his the people he's talking to to give him their response to give him energy and that to succeed in this event, he had to be prepared for times when people would refuse to do that. And you have to find a way to generate that energy from within. And he actually figured out how to do that um, over, he was a freshman at the time. And by the time he graduated, he was getting, you know, doing top things. Um, and I think that's the best advice I ever gave. He gave a speech at graduation and thanked all the teachers who had given him help in special ways. And he thanked me for telling him he was an extrovert. This is a, a really hard question for me because uh, this isn't meant to sound like arrogant, arrogant, but like giving advice is like breathing to me. Like it comes so naturally to give people advice where if someone comes to me with a problem, it's just like, oh, have you tried this? Like, have you tried this? So to, to think back about all the advice I've ever given people, I almost don't keep up with how it goes for them. So it's hard for me to tell what the best advice that I've given is because I've, <laughs> I've just given so much of it. Um, I, I mean, as someone who works in coaching, I would have to say it's probably something in the realm of type related content as well. But I don't know if it's the same for you all, but I feel like advice is, is literally a second language to me. That are like a love language. Like if you care enough, you'll give the advice. If you don't care, you'll just let them be. Uh, I don't I don't know, because I feel like I, I give advice to people uh, like I don't particularly like as well in hopes that maybe it will like undo that. Um, and when I give advice, I'm not like, like, hey, you should do this. It's like, have you considered? Is this something you're interested in? You know, that kind of thing. I'm just kind of putting it out there for people to, to try. My inclinations have always been to help people solve their problem, whatever that is. And, um, and it's taken me a while to learn to do it your way, Chris, to do it as uh, have you considered this? Uh, you might think about that rather than this is what you want to do. This would work if you did this. And um, I guess I don't consider that to be, I, 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 I didn't even consider that to be advice when I was thinking about this question, because that's just my natural approach to other people is how can I be helpful to them is I help you solve your problem. And they, of course, don't always want that. Yeah, sometimes people want a venting session. Yeah. So I find thinkers really do well when they ask beforehand, is this a venting session or is this a you want advice session? Just so I know the mode. I, I This was the one I struggled with the most. And um, I'm sure I go around giving advice all the time. 
I, th I think it was in the question of like, what's the best advice you've given anyone? It's like, was it any good? <laughs> um, did it help them? Um, and I'm a coach, so I, I hope, I hope sometimes I do. Um, but yeah, I found this one really, really hard to, to judge. I mean, since I've got older and, and I'm a coach, I, I take that similar approach as well of sort of trying to, rather than tell, guide people. Um, don't think that would have been my natural style, um, though. I think that's learned. But um, yeah, I, I guess I got caught up in the judgment of was it good advice? Was it not good advice? But pe a lot of people do come to me with problems. Um, so I must be doing something. But I, I think a lot of it actually is listening. Listening to other people is, I think, how I'm most helpful to them and um, not being judgmental about what they tell me. So, uh, I, yeah, a, a lot of people say to me that, you know, I feel like I could tell you anything and you would have no judgment on it and you just sort of see me as a person. And I, I yeah, and I think that comes naturally. So not quite advice, but yeah, but I'm sure I give advice all the time without realizing I'm telling people what they should do. I, to kind of piggyback off what you said, I think that there's a, a unique role that like INTJs can have in, uh, you know, like mental health and coaching and stuff where we don't have the traditional warm empathy that you might see with like the NFJs, but we have this empathy, I think, where people can feel understood with the INTJ, where like, you know, a lot of us are very good listeners. We're willing to listen to your problem. And because our TE isn't as aggressive as like the TE first types, we, we know sometimes when to just listen. And I feel like that can be very important in that, uh, that dynamic. Yeah, you're so right about that. For instance, Michael is a really good listener. He's like a vault of secrets. And in fact, he kind of likes drama too. So hearing about people's juicy stories is kind of entertaining for him. And so like INTJs are good listeners. And <laughs> these are these are conversations you should have with close friends. And it's fine. Gossip with close friends. But don't indulge in gossip. That's that, that you know that's not um shared between friends it's a bonding experience right <laughs> within every intj is an esfp that loves the tea you know <laughs> yeah, totally, the totally. <laughs> there, there totally is um i the only thing i'd say on this is i had i had hard i, I had a hard time uh uh coming up with with specific examples i think i was thinking it mainly in context of, of close friendships and um you know i, I think with close friends you don't tend to sit down and have specifically advice sessions. I mean, maybe sometimes, but um, I'm also often surprised by the things that the things that I'll say that are absorbed by people I'm talking with, like with friends, I, I find that, and I think this, this goes for everybody. You find that you say something that is kind of taken on as a shared axiom that it's like that it the uh, the friendship builds from that and then advice also builds from that because you have a shared language that you're developing over time with somebody else i think uh, another thing about i would add about listening is that it's also giving me context about the person's problem and how they're observing a problem and uh if someone if someone needs guidance I find that they're typically not observing a situation fully and then asking questions and finding a way to, to expand their perspective on the issue, which they're also giving me perspective that I can turn around in my, turn around in my mind and, and just sort of guide them with that. And maybe you're not looking at this from, you know, all, all sides. So um, those are, that's not direct advice, but it's just a, a, a way that I find that I prefer to, um, if I can help to guide somebody by expanding their perception and helping them observe a situation in, in a new way. Yeah, if I, if I can jump on that as well, I think for me, um, I always need context. I need, to, I need to know everything around whatever the thing is and what's influencing and how it will connect. And I think that leads me to ask a lot of questions which i guess looks like listening and helping and sometimes in in just doing that the person starts to get some insights or you know oh, i never thought of that or didn't think about the influence of this and that so again i think it comes back to that first thing i said about being able to see connections by exploring those connections with someone it gives them insight into the connections and yeah so it's not again not advice but using my own way of looking at something to help them 
I guess I took the word advice in a particular way as like telling someone this is a good thing to do. This is a better way, better thing to do than you're doing. Um, when like, like the rest of you, I think most of what I've done that's been helpful to people is offer a different perspective, um, help them work through their own uh, perceptions and underline for them what I'm hearing and reflect that back. And I, I don't consider that to be advice. Mm -hmm, yeah. So what I'm hearing is the biggest impact you have on people's lives is being there for them and being a listening ear and also possibly offering some psychoanalysis. It's almost oh. like guiding someone through like very practical introspection where it's like you're, you're teaching them how to get in their own mind. But instead of having that very like F.E. approach to it, you're being like, here's the T.E. implications of what it can mean to observe your own emotions, thoughts and, you know, outcomes. Very well put. Yeah, and I think of I think it's a good point to clarify on what we mean by advice because I think of advice is is what is what someone needs is you need to take prudent action and how do I get the point across that this is this is my recommendation at least of of what should be done in this case right so it's just the I think of it maybe more broadly as just the what what's the method of guiding someone to that to that conclusion is how I just generally think about advice. Got it. And so my next question is, what are the core philosophies or guiding principles that you live your life by, even if just loosely? This was another hard one. Um, and I'm sure I do. I, I, I sort of, it might even be that introverted intuitive thing. Like I know my weird philosophy of life, but can I explain it to anyone? No um it's my little internal yeah how the universe works but the things i i wrote down were the questioning i love questioning things like especially conventional thinking why, why is it like that why should you do it like that um why does that thing exist um so questioning conventional thinking um and looking for alternatives um Taking opportunities, I think, has come to me later in life that, um, you know, if you get invited to something or there's something going on, unless it's something you really, really hate, give it a go. But I think that's an older person's, um, you know, thing. And, and sometimes it feeds my extroverted sensing as well. It's something I didn't think I'd want to do. And it, it turned out to be great. And and something that um, I don't think is typical of all INTJs, um, and I know, I'm an Enneagram 5, and I know a lot of Enneagram 1s are, are INTJs, but just things can be good enough. Don't be a perfectionist. Um, I've never really been a perfectionist or anything, but I know a lot of INTJs are, so that might that might clash with things. But if things are good enough, that's that's fine. So there are a few, a few things I came up with, but I'm sure, I'm sure I have some really, really deep philosophy somewhere in my introverted intuition <laughs> as well trying to sound cool. <laughs> Angelina mentioned the perfectionism. And so it's pretty interesting. A lot of INTJs tend to type out as five and one. Those are the most common Enneagram types for this personality type. But there's also the hidden INTJ Enneagram nine. And they typically don't know that they're nines because they tend to think that they're fives or ones. Because five and one just sound like INTJ. So it's easy for an INTJ who's not that to still think that they are those because there's so much overlap between the descriptions. And so I guess the reason why I asked you guys this question is because I sometimes view introverted intuition as it's sure it's looking for ideas, but instead of like extroverted intuition, that's looking for possibilities and in, in a way where they're not tied to any of the possibilities in any sort of way. For an introverted intuitive, I notice a lot of them, they like to have this new idea or unconventional way of thinking to almost cause a paradigm shift. So the way that they see reality, you have a clearer end picture of it, or it's just, it, it makes more sense. Like it, it's more elegant, elegant explanation of reality in a way that for some people changes the way that you navigate reality or think about reality in your mind. And so I kind of see it as a guiding principle or like mini paradigm shifts that you have that actually change your orientation through life. And I don't know exactly how to put it. That's not the most elegant way. 
But some NI users have that where like looking at the world in a broad way helps them change the way they fundamentally view life. But it's in a this way that might be hard to explain. It's kind of nebulous. Maybe um, I can illustrate it. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm a Darwinian Jungian. Um, I started out to be a biology teacher and um, and the I, I the way that I was raised, I understood geologic time and evolution. That was something I was always interested in. and um, and really, I looked at how does the natural world work and to try and come up, I, I think my whole life I've been working on the ultimate integrated theory of what it is to be human. And it started out with biology. And then um, I was introduced that, so there's sort of a common, common knowledge about NTs that when we reach a point in our life where we wanna, where we have a problem and we wanna understand something, we go and take a course. So my husband and I did that. And, um, and one of the things we learned in this course was Jungian dream work. And then that became a piece of my ultimate integrated theory of what it is to be human is the understanding that we are on a personal journey towards wholeness and that we have dreams and fantasies and unconscious material that help us on the way to help us incorporate that unconscious part of ourselves. And then when I learned type, of course, that just fit in with it. So, um, so I kind of have, um, that's, that's kind of my picture of what human beings are and how we're made and what life is all about, what my life is all about. And it continues to develop. Now I'm 73 and I'm still learning and growing and adding more unconscious contents. But I've also acquired a few rules of thumb along the way. And one of them is that most of the unhappiness or conflict in the world is the result of disappointed expectations. And one of the things that, you know, there was a lot that wasn't right about me growing up, you know, like I was spacey and I had no common sense and I didn't understand people, but I was reliable, I was dependable. And so keeping my commitments has always been important to me and not disappointing people has always been important to me. And this idea of what are the expectations, I'm very aware of what the expectations are, but I'm also very aware of when people's expectations are unrealistic and how miscommunication happens around that. And that's sort of been another guiding principle for me is this idea that um, that if people would just give up so that their expectations or if they would examine their expectations and adjust them to reality, um, life would go a bit better. So there you are, <laughs> overarching principles and ideas and theories and rules of thumb. Yeah, that's really well put, Karen. And so I see introverted intuition as a spiral. So they take the same broad ideas that they may be conscious or unconscious of, and they go deeper into them. It's almost like they, they spiral into the idea, into a deeper understanding as they figure out something that gives them a slight paradigm shift that helps them refine their, their vision or idea of something. So it's almost like a, a rule of thumb that makes something even clearer to them. So... I just want to add to Karen's keeping commitments was my, was the first thing that I, that I wrote down. Yeah. Don't d never break a commitment because a more interesting opportunity is presented itself. It's dishonorable. Uh, so that was the first, <laughs> that was the first uh, thing that I had, but going back to the, the, the topic of unconventional uh, ways of looking at and understanding things that Angelina first brought up is, is an interesting one, a very interesting one because it's, it's, a lot of that is keeping in mind how how conventional, and th this goes for all of us, how conventional so much of our thinking is. Like Joyce, you have another topic that we're going to discuss in a bit about how how INTJs experience emotions is the topic, and that conversation, the conversation that we're going to be having about that, wouldn't have made sense 
at all, even 200, maybe 250 years ago. Like a lot, like what, what we're going to be basing that conversation on, I assume, is concepts that are very new. And that's, that's so much of our thinking is axiomatic in that way. It's just things that, that we've received. And so much of it is um, not tradition in the sense of, of, of tradition in the way that it's, it's often used, but just traditional in the sense of, you know, just, just principles and uh, uh, frames and ways of thinking that are, that are very, very new. And that if, again, if you go back a few hundred years, literally the conversation would have made no sense. So I think thinking radically about those things and being able to um, just step outside of what are really deeply ingrained cultural um, uh, axiomatic ideas and perceptions of things is something that is good to do as long as you don't drive yourself insane <laughs> by doing it because you can go crazy doing that too so it's it's sort of like i guess the principle there is like think think radically um act like a normal like a normal act prudently <laughs> yeah but that's fascinating to us i think is uh, for our type though and i don't i think i think um it's something that we're good at because it's something that's just naturally interesting to us just different ways of thinking about things and perceiving things so I think for me, I've got two that I that I really live by. And the, the first one is, it's hard for me to kind of put it to words, but it's that it's important to live in accordance with the person that you either are or the person that you know you want to be. Um, and almost everything that I do is like, I guess you could say it's almost like I'm constantly FI checking myself, like every time I make a decision where it's like, yes, I know this is the thing that will get me my goal, but would it be immoral to do this? Or would it go against the kind of person that I see myself as? So there's this constant counterbalance. But because I have such a strong relationship with that side of myself, I never second question myself in regards to my ethics or morals when I'm making a decision. I always know that I'm being authentic to myself. Um, and it's important for me to maintain that throughout my life. So that way, if I achieve my goal, I know I did it in accordance with the person that I believe myself to be. Um, and then the other thing that I really strongly live by is that I don't believe in can't. And what I mean is that like I, if I want it, nothing's impossible. I don't have any self-doubt about my abilities or capabilities when it comes to something if I want it. But... It, it has to be a desire, it has to be a want, it has to be a goal. And when I was younger, I had a more twisted version of that philosophy. And I very distinctly remember, you know, being like a teenager. And it was kind of the mindset of like, if you need help, work harder. And I, eventually that kind of evolved into, well, it's okay to have help. It's okay to work with others. But I still have that mindset of like, nothing is out of reach. And that's a very strong core belt philosophy that I live by. Do you have low neuroticism in the big five? Yes. I find people who tend to say, I don't believe in can't, and I believe that I, I can achieve anything I put my mind to it, are more low neuroticism beliefs. Just correlation, and not not everyone, right? Well, but it is kind of funny that you you say that, because I feel like the further I get pushed into that like corner of like, oh, I'm struggling to do something, it's almost like the more neurotic I get. Where it's like, if I continue to fail, it's almost like I just keep double downing on on efforts and eventually that gets to the point where it's like okay now i don't have time for my friends and then if that fails it's like okay now i don't have time for my family and it's like <laughs> and then it's like then i don't have time for my health and, and until that goal is achieved the neuroticism kind of rises but at a base level i'm very much not a neurotic person mm, i mean that's a good baseline so when you see chris and he's neurotic there's some sort of situation like that going on so who or where do you look to for life advice and where would you recommend people look for advice on life? And I know, Angelina, for you, you're like, no one, which I, I think might be more correlated with Enneagram 5. So it's like, yeah, I am my own, re I am my own resource for that. It's, 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 again, when I first looked at it, I was thinking of advice as those little snappy one-liners that people give you that you never forget, like put it in the bin or be the bin. That is actually a good one. Um, but um when I thought of it more broadly, I I actually put myself. I reckon, um, <clears throat> but more if I'm if I'm looking for something, I will go introspective, and I um, 
like I did a, an art collage project over lockdown that was really helpful in in things and I do a collage now every year with my vision my vision board and I sit there for ages thinking okay what do I want this year to look like and what do I need to have in place to make that happen um so I, I guess I do it through um what would you call them like projective techniques on my on my own so collage art um music sometimes a particular song keeps bothering me and then I think what's it saying to me and what are the lyrics about mm, okay so um something will come up there um I tend to do a, a tarot card every morning with my friend and um, think, okay, what does this what does this say to me today? What's it making me think about? So it's very much, um, I tend, and if I've got a problem, I tend to sit there scribbling things down and drawing diagrams and stuff. So I, th I think when I need life advice, I go introspective. It's probably not a good idea, but that's what I do. I tend to think the best um, the best advice is advice that you absorb over time. I think going going after advice on a particular topic or for a particular issue, then just I find find someone who's familiar with it and uh, um, work with them directly. But in terms of in terms of, and again, this is we're broadening the definition of advice, but I think it holds because it's still it's still guidance. Um, I I always recommend have a habit of reading fiction, read serious fiction, because you'll find you'll find more uh, you'll absorb more advice just just in, a, in an ambient kind of way by um, reading Shakespeare, Tolstoy. Alice Munro, George Orwell. I mean, like these, it's, it's, it's not just a, a matter of entertaining yourself, right? It's developing the sensibility and absorbing, absorbing um, perspectives, ways of being and, and uh, what I would broadly call, call advice as well. I mean, it's not a, not in the most practical sense, but I think it's, it's a good habit to have and we're seeing less and less of it. So I wanted to put a, I wanted to put a word in for, um, um, reading fiction in particular. I think for me, this is not going to be the traditional kind of answer, but I think the best place to look for advice is in your own failures. And really to kind of like analyze, like if you've messed up something or have done wrong, you know, look at that and then see if there's anybody in your life who also saw that or knows you who might be able to give you a second perspective on that, especially like a mentor figure, if there's someone in that kind of realm. Because I feel like a lot of the times our failures are the things that really allow us to grow as opposed to our successes. But you have to be, you know, mentally mature enough to recognize that that's where growth comes from, is in messing up and then learning from those mistakes. That's really great, Chris. I, I've had one of the least traumatic lives of anybody I know. But I'd like to say that I've made the most of all that I have had, that there any any time um, I've life has kicked me in the stomach. I've really looked to see what I could learn from it. And um, I, I think that's that's a great way to grow. And I, maybe our type does that more than other types. I don't know. Um, one. So where do I look for advice like Angelina? My, the inner wisdom. I mean, that's, I don't, I don't think that's, um, I, for me, that's the first place to go is what are my dreams telling me? What, you know, um, if I meditate on this, what will I get? Um, and I have a book that like, to, I don't do tarot cards, but I, I have a book of, um, it's a, 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 a collection of writings about the religious way. And it's one that I can just open in the morning. And that paragraph has something for me. Um, taking courses. <laughs> I, I, I don't recommend that for everybody, but it certainly has worked for me. Um, I'll mention landmark education as something that I did that really covered the waterfront. Psychotherapy. Um, is another way, but I find that when I when I really am looking for something helpful, introspection first, and um, and and I don't naturally turn to other people. 
it just it isn't um i it just it it hardly ever really hits the spot and so i i i have other ways of finding something but i've i've always read and i've always found nuggets of wisdom in what i've read and i remember a lot and often i will take notes as I'm reading something. I want to remember this. I want to remember that. And um, I, I agree. Good fiction is great. Um, I read a lot of um, nonfiction, inspirational reading, a whole variety. Um, the most recently, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is based on Native American wisdom. Um, so there's, there's a whole range of places where wisdom can come from. And... Um, and so I, I think I use them all, but I, I agree with Angelina, introspection first. You know what life advice resonates with you based on what you actually need to hear at that moment in your life too. So it's all about what you really need. It, it'll stick out to you or you'll just interpret everything within the frame of that. You're like, that wasn't intended for that, but now I can twist it into helping my situation. All right. What is your experience of N-I-T-E-F-I-S-E, the cognitive functions of the INTJ? You can give a little bit of a small, elegant, your way of explaining it. Okay, I made some notes. Um, my experience of introverted intuition, it comes in inner nudges, it comes in dreams, it comes in images, um, and I seek inward for clarity and then I act and that's how I use it. Um, I have a hunger for intellectual stimulation. I need hope like air to breathe. I think that all has to do with introverted intuition. Extroverted thinking, whatever organization I find myself involved with, I seem to end up in leadership somehow. And, um, you know, sometimes people just say, oh, you're organized, why don't you blah, blah, blah. But also it's because I often have a vision of um, how things could be and how things would work better. And I wanna implement that. Um, introverted feeling was pretty unconscious for me until I was in my twenties. Um, and then I had one of those life kicks you in the stomach experiences. And I started asking, what kind of a person would I be if I did this? What kind of a person would I be if I did that? What kind of a person do I want to be? And now that becomes a part of, like Chris said, um, a part of how one makes decisions about how one leads one's life. And in extroverted sensing, um, for most of my life, it frightened me. I, I had an, it, it seemed, I think that whenever I expressed that part of myself, I got put down for it. Like, you know, I was told I was too loud or out of control or, you know, people won't like that if you say that. And I tried to repress it. And it seemed like it was, you know, that song, Born to be Wild, that, that to me has expressed the essence of extroverted sensing. And to me, that was frightening. And that if I followed it, I would get in trouble. Um, but the way that I found that I could express it was very childlike. Um, I love being in nature um, and or just like walking around the neighborhood or going into a gift shop or going to a museum. And it comes out as, oh, look at that. Oh, look at this. Isn't that cool? And it's, it's um, not that well developed. So it still has um, a scary side. Um, and I'm, I'm still working with that one. To kind of piggyback off of that, I had a realization just in the past couple of years with, with SE, and I felt like growing up, I was always, always, always the most cautious look before you leap type of person. And I feel like there's some value in like leap before you look. Like sometimes that can really be beneficial, especially to an INTJ. And I've learned that, and I think somebody talked about it earlier in this um, in the call where they mentioned like saying yes to someone asking you to go out places or something, or like when someone invites you to stuff. That was something that I just started learning how to do the past couple of years. It's had a huge impact on like the enjoyment that I've gotten out of life with SE. 
it just a couple of weeks ago, friends were like, hey, do you want to go to this bar after we go do this thing? And, and inside my mind, I'm like, I'm not going to like a bar. It's going to be loud. There's going to be music. There's going to be people being wild. And I went and I had a great time. And it's like, if, if you can just convince yourself to like step out of your SC comfort zone as an INTJ, you can really, really have some good times. Yeah, that's well put. I think for some INTJs, it takes a while for them to start things, but they're good at refining or improving what people give to them in the sense of just knowing what will work and what could be better. And so this relates back to the INTJ perfectionism that we're talking about and how they look too much before leaping. And so what happens is that like sometimes with some INTJs, they spend a long time writing an email before sending it to someone because they want it to be just perfect. And then they realize sometimes just sleeping and not putting too much perfectionism into writing this might work work in a way that's better for them. And so, yeah, well put, Chris. I guess if I want to add one more thing, since I was already speaking about the functions um, in my journey, is that like... As an INTJ, it's important to kind of temper your NI with your FI a little bit. And I think, Karen, you said, like, that was something you kind of found in your 20s, right? But I think a lot of INTJ teens in particular can have almost this, like, greatness at any cost type of mentality. Because NI doesn't feel the need to restrict itself by, like, being good or being a moral person or caring about other people's feelings and that sort of thing. But I feel like you can actually achieve more by being aware of, like, the implications of your and I and how that is going to impact not only yourself but the people you care about. So um, <clears throat> I'll start at the other end. I, tend, um, I think um, with that talk of exercising and things, that's where I'm using my extroverted sensing well now. Whereas as a as a child, I disregarded that sort of thing. Um, so that's where I use it well. It, it has its downside as well of like overindulgence um, tendencies and things like that as well. Um, so yeah, that that's there. Introverted feeling, I think, has been dotted around my life as as identity sort of questions and um, trying to find that you know what am I, who am I really, and get you know finding that talk of convention earlier, getting pulled into conventional things and dragged along into a life that isn't me, and then suddenly going, no, hang on, who am I again? So this you know this doesn't feel right. Um, so I think it's shown up in those sorts of ways. And doing the art project I, I mentioned earlier really like made me take a big trawl through my my life identity thing. That was quite an interesting thing. Um, extroverted thinking, I, I think j just life has made me spend a lot of time doing that, um, doing stuff, being organized um, as, as an adult. Whereas thinking back to when I was a child, it was all about that you know being alone reading fiction getting absorbed in fantasy thinking of the symbolism of of books and what the characters mean and you know proper um be, being able to be immersed in introverted intuition as a child was lovely and as an adult i i think i lost that for a while um in the busy world of life um and now I don't know, I just find that when, when I'm on my own and I'm not pressured to do anything, I feel just really nice and floaty and I don't know, my mind just goes here and there and I think of things and I just feel really good. <laughs> so I think it it works itself. I don't know what it's doing, but I guess as, as you're introverted and dominant thing, it is just like, it's like you're, um, the operating system on your computer, isn't it? It's, it's there and you couldn't do without it, but you, you don't see it. Yeah, I really find that like introverted intuition is that it's like happiest when I'm doing something casually se related like going on a walk for example or it's like suddenly i feel really deeply engaged with my internal world and i'm able to like process thoughts and have those you know images and stories in my head yeah there are two ways to prompt an eye or to think better with it and it's either doing something physical while also just thinking in the subconscious or thinking in the back burner, like what Chris was just saying, or you could take the sensory deprivation route too. And so thank you INTJs for coming out today. I appreciate your wisdom and life advice, and I'm sure it'll help benefit INTJs that are looking for, okay, now that I know I'm an INTJ, what kind of advice or, or practical application can I get from this? This is, so this is good in a TE application sense. Now, how can I make myself more effective now that I know I'm an INTJ? <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Thank you for coming out. Speaking of uh, how to become a more effective INTJ, 
Angelina has a course on unleashing your INTJ superpowers on her website, Type Pro. That's another way to get life advice as an INTJ. Thanks for coming out today. And yeah, as <laughs> Chris is laughing because he knows that it's awkward for me to compliment INTJs. I'm like, hmm, a lot of them have a weird relationship with words of affirmation. So <laughs> I just want to take a moment to just recognize how it's funny how the INTJs are wearing dark colors today. And so it's just a thing. I just thought it was an INTJ stereotype that's kind of true in this panel too. And so yeah, feel free to check out these wonderful people on this panel. And I'll see you all in the next one. Bye. <music>